Welcome to Convos from the Couch by Life Stance Health, where leading mental health professionals help guide you on your journey to a healthier, more fulfilling life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Convos from the Couch by Life Stance Health. I'm Nicolette Lianza, and on this episode, I'll be talking with Paulo Ignizio, a clinician from one of our Life Science Cleveland, Ohio offices, and she will be helping us to understand gambling addiction. So welcome, Paula. Great to have you on. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know, I'm really glad we're having this conversation today because from my understanding, gambling addiction can affect millions of people within the U.S. alone. So it's so important that we're talking about this today. Yes, that's very correct. So um, understanding what gambling is. So it's anytime you are putting down money or items um, for a game of chance, for any type of chance where you're expecting some type of a payout or prize. So, um, you know, that that can be just about anything. There are so many different things that fall into that raffles the lottery, um, the casinos, the racinos, all of that. So there's lots of different ways that people gamble. And and so that's interesting that, you know, I think people just think traditional gambling, going into a Las Vegas casino, but this can look way more extended than that with raffles, bingo, maybe even. So we'll be definitely talking more about that. To begin, though, let us have you tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you become interested in uh, specializing in gambling addiction. Sure. Um, So I've always, well, I'm an addiction counselor, so I I do um, alcohol and drug addiction counseling. Uh, And so the interest in behavioral addictions um, and having someone that you can talk to about that, that became an interest of mine. And out of that offshoot came the gambling addiction, gambling disorder is what it's actually called medically. Um, And so, you know, knowing that it's a big problem. um, And in Ohio, um, we're assuming with the online um, sports gambling that just started January 1st, um, there's going to be more people that are going to be gambling and maybe end up with a problem with it. You and I both work out of our Ohio Life Science offices here. And so this is a big deal for Ohio because this just happened in the new year for there to be sports right. betting and things like that. I'm not actually sure how many other states allow this, but I know for here in Ohio, it was a pretty big deal. And I do agree. I think we're going to see a big increase in this type of addiction for sure. So is there a particular a common age that we see, uh, age range that we see people struggling with gambling addiction? Um, the, the biggest risks are for people 65 and over. And then uh, people like 14 to 24. Um, we know that they gamble two to three times more than adults. Um, and that's interesting to think about, you know, teenagers gambling, but they're using um, gaming oh, and yeah. some of the gaming has loot boxes. I don't know if you've ever heard of loot boxes. I have not. Tell me more about them. Yeah. So loot boxes are something that you can pay money for to get extra lives, extra. Oh, things. yeah. So I didn't know that's what the name of it was. Yeah. Loot boxes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And okay. in some countries, they've uh, banned that. Uh, because they do know that it seems to be um, connected with gambling addiction. Uh, So it starts really young with kids, and then they already have this, you know, interest in putting money in and getting something for it, a prize or whatever. So it's interesting to see the strata of who is more likely to struggle with this. We have seniors on one end, or definitely sounds like adolescence and into young adulthood. So that kind of middle age where I actually thought we would see a lot of it there, but that's not the case at all. So that's really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Yeah. And uh, a lot of times with the 65 plus, um, they have buses where they'll take them to casinos. Right. And uh, so that becomes, you know, a 
a way of having a hobby or something, well, where they get out with other people. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big problem with that with the seniors. Very true. Very true. I know my own grandparents used to do that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So that is a good point. I you know on one end, it's it's great for making friends and socializing, but not so good on the other end here with the actual gambling piece of it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, a couple of other interesting things as far as people at risk, veterans. Um, okay. Interesting side note is that um, gambling addiction therapy started in Ohio. Oh, that's interesting. At, at, the, at the Brexville VA in the 70s. Wow. The Veterans Administration started it in Brexville. So, um, and for our listeners who don't know, Brexville, Brexville is a city in Northeast Ohio, Brexville, yes, Ohio, sorry, and there's a, a yes. large veteran administration's yeah. hospital there. So I actually did not know that's where it started. That's really interesting. Yeah. So a lot of times you'll hear when, when you're learning about gambling addiction is the Ohio model. Um, so it is, you know, directly from our area. Wow. So this is definitely very poignant that we're having this conversation about even the Ohio model here, and we're both practicing clinicians from Ohio. Yeah. Interesting. Um, another group of people that are at risk of gambling is the Asian community. Okay. Tell me more about that. Well, there's um, they do a lot of games of chance. Okay. Um, in the in their homes, um, and um, a lot of times they go to the corner store and buy the scratch off tickets. Okay. Um, okay. and that type of thing. So you know, we see a lot of that. Um, also, people in recovery are at okay. risk. You know, mm -hmm. they already have that kind of addictive personality, um, and so they can have problems as they're. Um, in recovery, uh, picking up another addiction. addiction. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I can see that. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at specific signs or some common signs that someone might have in a gambling addiction, can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, so one of the signs would be that um, they're more irritable, um, especially if they're not gambling. So if, if they've you know, they're trying to stay away from it. You may see more irritability. Okay. Um, you also find them asking to borrow money uh, because they're not able to pay their regular bills. Um, they'll even hide bills. So if they they live in a family and there's other people and they're not paying the bills because they're using the money for gambling. Oh yeah. They may okay. hide the bills. They won't tell how much they've lost. Um. So you, you see a difference in how they act at work even. Um, they may be preoccupied. They may be irritable, um, having trouble concentrating, uh, problems with relationships, family, friends. Um, so a lot of the same things that we see in other addictions. So you'll see with gambling addiction as well. Mm -hmm. Got you. So what are some strategies you found to be most effective in helping individuals overcome their gambling addiction? Um, so uh, first of all, getting the, the gambler to come in and actually admit to it is one of the biggest issues. Um, a lot of times it comes out when you're talking about other um, things because uh, gamblers tend to have um, comorbidity, other mental health issues, maybe addiction, uh, depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. um, uh, personality disorders is very common among okay. that gamble. Uh, so getting them in and at first and doing some motivational interviewing um, where we're talking about, you know, how do you feel about this? And do you feel like you can make some changes and getting them to make small changes to begin with? Uh, in order to be able to do any of the um, actual work, um, they do have to uh, abstain for a while um, so that they're ready to make some of these bigger changes that we ask. A lot of the things that I do are the same things that I would do with somebody with a substance use problem. And we talk about the brain and how the brain works and the reward mm -hmm. center. 
um, because it's the same thing that lights up in the brain for gambling as lights up in the brain for um, alcohol and drugs. And that might be something people don't recognize is that when you're working in addictions, that there's a similarity to how the brain is working with that addiction and and the reward centers and stuff like that. So be it being addicted to food or sex or gambling or, or you name it, it's, it all kind of is wired in the same. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Um, And one of the interesting things is that uh, gambling disorder is the only um, behavioral addiction that is recognized uh, in the DSM, which is our diagnostic manual that we use. Uh, So they're they're looking at gaming also. Uh, It's something that they're considering, but it's not actually a verified diagnosis, whereas gambling disorder is. And again, another good point is that with the DSM, it's you just see the gambling addiction there. You don't see, you know, I just named a few others that oftentimes yes. clinicians will help people navigate through, but that's really only the formal behavioral addiction. Like Correct. I think it's the opening door yeah. into some of this other stuff. The problem is that uh, some of the other addictions, um, they're not able to quantify as well. Good point. Very good point there. And so it it sounds like the overall approach is more of a motivational interviewing approach. Is that how you? Yeah, Um, we also use cognitive behavioral therapy because there's a lot of uh, thinking, um, unhelpful thinking that goes into gambling um, where they're always chasing their losses. So um, I go and I gamble and I lose $3,000, $3,000, I'm going to go back the next day to make that up. Um, you know, they think that uh, certain machines have luckiness to them. Um, and, you know, we know from the way that they're set up that it's it's a computer. And mm-hmm. so there's no luck. There's no, you know, you can sit there all day and it's going to spit out what it spits out. It's programmed to keep you sitting there if you're talking specifically about a slot machine or whatever. It's it's programmed to keep you sitting there. So it might exactly. throw a little bit out at you every so often just to keep your butt in that seat to keep playing it. That's right. really what it's about. Right. Most right. definitely. Yeah. So some of the um, strategies that we use are... Um, harm reduction. So if somebody isn't having some of the major problems with um, money and and, uh, paying their bills, we may talk about just harm reduction. So like lowering the amount of time you go, um, only taking cash with you, uh, making sure that you're not overdoing it or going with somebody who's going to keep you at that place. some people need to go cold turkey. They just need to abstain. They can't go near a casino. They can't uh, go online. They can't do any of those things. Uh, there's also Gamblers Anonymous. Uh, some people find that very helpful. Uh, and then we also have things online. So if you have a problem with gambling online, there's some voluntary things that you can do. There's It's Gam Block is one of them and Gam Ban. And what they do is they will set it up so that anytime you try to go to a gambling site, it will not allow you. Okay. Okay. So that's voluntary. There's also a uh, voluntary exclusion program, which is for casinos and racinos. And so you can go in and have them block you for one year, five years, lifetime. And what that does is you sign a paper that says, if you come on site, if you come to one of those casinos, they can charge you with trespassing. Wow. I didn't know this was a thing that uh, racinos or casinos will participate in this and and helping the person not, you know, continue to gamble at their site. So they'll charge you with trespassing, it sounds like. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So it it becomes very serious. Um, because of, you know, the legal ramifications of it. So it's got to be somebody who's ready to do something like that. So tell me about 
how you address some of the underlying issues or triggers that contribute to a person's gambling addiction? Sure. So there are a lot of things that are underneath all of this. Um, you know, what we know is that 96% of people with problem gambling have another um, co-occurring disorder. 96%. Wow. That's, 96%, that's high. percent wow. Yeah. Um, 73% have a, an alcohol or drug use disorder. Um, 60% are dependent on nicotine. Uh, 50% have a mood disorder. 41% have an anxiety disorder. Um, 77% have suicidal thoughts. Wow. And the attempt so is the suicide attempt is the highest rate of any addiction. Uh, one in five people with gambling disorder will make a suicide attempt. Paula, that was something else I was not aware of, how high the suicide rates. One in five. That's huge. That's astonishing. Yeah. Wow. So making sure that while you're treating the addiction, that you're also looking for these other things, because these are the underlying things that oftentimes lead people to having a gambling disorder. Right, right. So then how do you work with individuals to develop a plan to prevent relapse? That one's difficult. Um, I think, you know, one of the things is the support group. Um, the Gambling Anonymous. Um, there's other support groups that you can find too. Uh, knowing that they have to learn to forgive themselves, um, being able to understand that, you know, this is not something after, after a certain point, it's the brain taking over and not mm -hmm. them. Um, also understanding that relapse can often be part of recovery. Yeah. Yep. That happens. Um, learning what their triggers are. Stress is oftentimes a big trigger. Uh, problems in relationships can be a big trigger. Uh, so looking for the support system, the people that are really there for you, family and friends. Uh, that can help too. And then depending on how uh, deeply they've gotten in debt, having a financial advisor. Okay. Sometimes is an important thing to do. You mentioned, you know, having family and friends or loved ones as part of the treatment process. How do you involve them into the treatment process? Yeah. So um, the, Gamblers Anonymous has GAM Anon which is for family and friends. Uh, so that is something where they can go and learn more about it. Uh, there's also open meetings with Gamblers Anonymous where family and friends can go with the person that's having the issue and work on it that way. Um, you know, understanding just like in any other addiction that it doesn't just affect the person who has the disorder. It does affect the whole family. Um, we know that children who live in a household with folks that have a gambling addiction oftentimes have physical and mental health issues. Um, they'll also uh, may have uh, problems with school. So looking at is there other uh, family members we need to look at and treat? Right, right. Which would be something, I, again, I don't think people would recognize that this could be a family dynamic issue going on as well. Exactly. Uh, so how do you address the financial consequences of gambling addiction in treatment? Um, so they can't be addressed until the person actually believes they have a problem. Okay, so that so would be step one. Right. That is definitely step one. Um, and then uh, recommending that someone else in the household pay the bills, perhaps. Um, and then having that person just set up with maybe a weekly cash budget. Uh, and so that they don't have any of that um, 
temptation. Uh, there's a, a credit card that you can get, which is called TrueLink credit, um, that only puts so much money on the credit card and um, will link it to another family member so that they know what's being charged and they can see if there's any problems with them going someplace where, you know, because you can, you can walk into uh, a lot of bars and there's Kino and yeah. there's other machines. So um, kind of watching where the money's going is important. Well, I mean, you're giving some really great resources that I know I wasn't aware of. So I, I know I appreciate you giving these very specific resources. Sure. What advice do you have for loved ones of someone struggling with gambling addiction? Number one, don't lend the gambler any money or pay off their debts. Um, that would be like giving, you know, somebody money to go and buy cocaine. Um, you're just enabling the behavior even more. Right. You're making it easier for them. Um, remove your name from joint accounts. You know, that sounds like a lot, but it, it's going to save your credit rating mm -hmm. and your ability to know what, where the money's going. Um, check the mail for bills. Get to them before right. and with the problem gets to them or have the bills sent directly to you through the Internet. That can do that, too. Um, and then if things are, are really in a bad way, get professional help to protect family assets. So a lot of this is about protecting family assets, uh, protecting oneself, it sounds like. So exactly. The person with the gambling addiction doesn't take away all the money or right. gamble all the money, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So I, a lot of it has to do with finances, but mm -hmm. also, you know, a loved one needs to practice some self care. Of course. Uh, that's where right. Gaminon can help with that um, because you have somebody who's going to be in the same boat as you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sharing those kind of things um, with each other is helpful. Right. My gosh, Paula, thank you. Again, you gave so many amazing resources and just sharing your knowledge on this very difficult addiction has been so helpful. And I'm sure our listeners will walk away with a lot of good resources and tips on how to help either themselves or loved ones that they know might have this issue. So thank you again. Sure, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. I also would like to thank the team behind the podcast, Jason Clayton, Juliana Widen, and Chris Kelman. Take care, everyone.